Okay, so we've talked about how we measure model fit in geographic space. Um, I want to add to that right now a little bit of a discussion about how E&M tools um, measures model fit in environment space. And I think this is really worth trying to understand because um, this is something that, that um, we just came up with for E&M tools. It doesn't, to my knowledge, exist anywhere else. And I think it might potentially be fairly useful. Um, right, so why would we do this? Why would we take a model and project it into some space of possible environments and ask how well it predicts the distribution of our species in that set of possible environments instead of focusing on the set of available environments? Well, there's a couple reasons for that. Um, one is that when we are essentially projecting our model into geographic space and evaluating it, uh, our model performance is going to be very strongly affected by the sets of conditions that are common in the space over which we're evaluating our model. So if our model gets a lot of stuff wrong, but happens to be right in the sets of environmental conditions that are common, then it'll have a really good fit in geographic space, even if it's a very poor fit in environment space. So your model may do a poor job of explaining how your species works in an, a, a bunch of sets of environmental conditions as long as the ones it does well in are really common in the evaluation uh, uh, region. So that's one reason to consider uh, 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 including model evaluation in environment space. Uh, another one is that it can detect some pathological behavior. So if you're if you're sort of looking at this, this model actually uh, I'm afraid this, this ramp doesn't have a lot of contrast, but it's actually doing a pretty good job of predicting where our species uh, it has been found down here, um, not as good up here. And it's saying that our species, uh, uh, the, the habitat is not suitable at the places where we haven't seen our species before. And so in geographic space, this is actually a pretty good model. I'll give you the exact statistics on this in a minute. However, if you actually look at this model in environment space, this is that same model. So now what we have here is two environmental predictors. They are the only predictors that were used to make this model. And what this model is saying is the combinations of these predictors, so these points are our actual occurrence points for our species. The color, the brighter colors in both of these, the brighter colors represent habitat the model thinks is more suitable. So this model is saying that uh, uh, the most extreme conditions for our species in both directions along this environmental gradient are the best conditions, and that it absolutely hates most of the places where it's found. Um, that's existentially depressing, but also from a biological standpoint, probably not accurate, right? Uh, you would like to think that species are okay living with the places where we see them most. I mean, it's not impossible that you've got uh, a, a widespread dispersal in a whole bunch of uh, a sink habitat, but it's far more likely that your model is wrong and your species kind of knows what it's doing, right? So this is a place where if we evaluate this model in geographic space, it looks okay. And if we, if we even just sort of visualize it, in environment space, it is obviously pathologically wrong. So what we would like is some metric where we could actually measure how well the model is predicting the distribution of our species in this space, uniformly distributed space of possible environments, rather than this, you know, biased space of, of available environments in the real world. So there's an obvious uh, a, a hole there that that fills where it can possibly help us detect pathological model behaviors, but there's a real issue here that's why people haven't done this before, which is asking what is the environmental background. Um, right, because here what we're doing is we've got a set of points where a species occurs, and we've got a whole bunch of grid cells where we haven't observed our species before. So those grid cells offer us a natural way to sample the background. But when we're talking about environment space, each of these gradients actually runs off more or less infinitely in either direction. And so there's not a clear delineation of where the background starts and stops. And there's not a clear way to sort of select uh, uh, from this available background in a way that makes sense. And uh, I'll dive into this a little bit more. So what we need to measure model fit discrimination accuracy in this environment space is a set of environments where we have not observed our species before, so background or pseudo-absence data. 
uh, and we need a natural way to select those that's informative. So one idea is to select all possible environments. And obviously we can't do that because a lot of these are continuous variables and so they're infinitely di dividable even within a, a fixed range. But as I said, also a lot of them can potentially run off infinitely in both directions. So we need a bounded environment space to evaluate this, uh, uh, this set of models in or this model in. But we also can't do, even once we've got a bounded environment space, and I'll talk about how we bound this in a minute, um, we also can't do like some sort of exhaustive comparison of bins like we did, uh, um, like we were talking about with our resource utilization functions for niche overlap and stuff like that. And the reason we can't do that is because we get too many bins super fast. So let's say we've got one environmental gradient, you can call this temperature or whatever. If we want to evaluate our model on just 10 bins, uh, uh, per gradient, well with one gradient or one predictor, that's fine. That means we have some set of these conditions under which we've observed our species, some set under which we haven't observed our species, and we just need to see what our model predicts in terms of suitability uh, for each of these bins. And for 10 points, no big deal. You can do that in a millisecond in R. Um, what happens if you add one more predictor? Well then, you've got 10 bins on this axis, 10 bins on this axis, and you actually need to look at every combination of those, right? So there's gonna be some set of conditions here under which your species has occurred, but there's gonna be a larger set under which you haven't observed it, and you need to evaluate your model predictions in every one of these combinations of these two axes. So one predictor, 10 bins, you've only got 10 bins. Two predictors for 10 bins, you've got 10 times 10 bins. So you've got 100 bins. And if you add a third predictor, you have a thousand bins. And if you have five predictors, you've already gotten up to a hundred thousand bins, a hundred thousand points or combinations of environments you need to evaluate your model under. So this gets big really quick. And let's say you're you're using all 19 of your, your bioclim uh, variables. You've got 10 billion billion combinations of environments that you need to evaluate to measure your model fit. And that's using only 10 bins per axis, which is actually, that's not a very fine scale. If you think about it, you've got a, 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 say you've got a temperature gradient that runs from 10 degrees C to 20 degrees C, that means you're only evaluating every one degree C increment, right? And that's, that's not a very fine scale way of uh, um, measuring the, the uh, fit of a model. So what we need is some way to represent a space of environmental gradients um, that is actually tractable, um, that, that doesn't actually run into these issues. And that turns out to be not super hard to do once you sort of think about it the right way. So we've got our occurrence points for our species, and we know what our model says about the set of environments where our species occurs, right? It gives us some suitability scores for those. So then in order to actually compare these to this set of environments that it doesn't live in, or hasn't been observed in, I should say. The first thing we need to do is bound the environment space. And by default, what ENM Tools does is it bounds each uh, predictor by the minimum and the maximum that are observed uh, across the training region or in the training data, right? And so this space along each gradient is, is, is bound at the minimum and maximum that the model was actually trained on, right? And so then we can, fit our observed points in here, but in order to get our background from here, we actually just want to sample at random, more or less uniformly, from this space of uh, possible environments. And we can actually do better than random uniform by using this thing called random Latin hypercube sampling. So what Latin hypercube sampling does is if you've got a whole bunch of different predictors or factors or whatever, it gets you an over dispersed set of combinations of those predictors so that you can look at how they all interact and stuff like that um, uh, without having to observe or, or measure every combination of variables. So this is used a lot in experimental design and things like that. So if experiments are expensive or in this case measuring model fit is expensive uh, um, for a, over a certain number of points then what you can do is you can use latin hypercube sampling to select a subset of those uh, uh, conditions that are as informative as they can be all right so what we do is we just use we pick the number of background points in environment space we want um, 
we uh, 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 select those points at random using random hypercube sampling, and then we measure what the model predicts the suitability of habitat is at those combinations of environments where we have not observed our species. And in the case of our pathological model I had here, in our geographic space, we've got a test AUC of 0 0.92. In environment space, we've got a test AUC of 0 0.03. This is kind of shocking, right? Because the expectation, at least the central tendency of the expectation for an uninformative model for AUC should be 0 0.5. So this is not just as bad as random. This is actually much, much worse than random, which makes sense when you look at the, the model here, right? That looks worse than random. Um, but in fact, if you measure model fit, it is far worse than random. This is an extraordinarily bad model that you could hardly have screwed up a, a worse if you tried. But this is actually a really key here. You've got these models that make interesting and possibly useful geographic predictions that can, when you actually look at them in the environment space and think about them as a, a, a estimates of underlying biology, they can look pathologically bad. Um, and so uh, we, we think that this environment space fit for uh, uh, niche models may actually turn out to be quite useful for diagnosing various types of misbehavior. Okay, so that's the idea. Uh, is it useful? That's actually what we're trying to determine right now. Uh, how well does it work? So this is all very much in progress, so I'm not going to delve very deep into the outcomes here um, because they are potentially still in flux. Um, but what we did is we simulated virtual species with known niches, we generated artificial occurrence data, built some models, we measured how well each model approximates the true niche and the true distribution of the species that we simulated, and then we kind of looked at whether any of our geographic or environment-based performance metrics are actually capable of picking good models from bad ones under these conditions. And, and we're not going to dig into this too deep, but, but essentially what we're finding is that actually, yes, some of these metrics uh, actually work better to pick good models in environment space than they do in geographic space, uh, depending on what sort of model performance you want. So they're actually, in environment space, often better at picking out good biological estimates, estimates that get the niche right, uh, but make not as good distribution estimates uh, than, than uh, uh, you would get by using those same metrics in geographic space. So this is, as I say, very much in progress, very much in development still. And the real question in the future is going to be, uh, um, you know, not just is this useful. I think we internally are already pretty satisfied that it is going to be useful, but how to balance this information for a set of models. If you've got a, a set of models that you're interested in, um, do you want the one that gets the best discrimination accuracy in environment space or the one that gets the best discrimination accuracy in geographic space? Um, either one could be true depending on what you're going to use that model for. So I know kind of between my previous model evaluation talk and this model evaluation talk, um, I've probably given you a lot of uncertainty um, and, and, and not as much guidance as you might want. But I, I think uh, uh, the appropriate way to think about this stuff is that you need to figure out what your model does and make up your own mind as to what's uh, important and what's useful for evaluation. Um, and I don't think it's really possible uh, or, or useful to give kind of blanket advice, you should use this metric over that metric because what they evaluate and what they're good for can be so wildly different. And if you sort of pick, you know, say test AUC in geographic space as just your, your metric for everything, uh, that's going to work really well in some situations and it's going to work really poorly in other situations. And I think what works well in which situations, um, we have intuitions, we have uh, fairly convincing verbal arguments. What we do not have is a kind of robust simulation literature that actually shows us what works under what conditions. And I, I think that would be kind of what we really need over the next few years. So, um, yeah, hoping to do some of that myself. Uh, maybe some of you could do some of that as well. It will be fantastic. Okay. Thank you.